Okay, thank, thanks very much, Sue, and uh, good morning, uh, everybody. Uh, welcome to our uh, webinar, the National Academic Integrity Network webinar on academic integrity from the second language uh, user's perspective. Uh, I'm Porik Walsh, I'm the Chief Executive of, of QQI, Quality and Qualifications Ireland, and I'm delighted to have along uh, this morning Professor Diane Pecorari from the City University of Hong Kong. I was in Hong Kong once and it was during a super typhoon. It was a very interesting experience, but a, a, a fascinating and fantastic, uh, vibrant city. Uh, Diane is, is the professor and head of the department at the Department of English at the City University uh, in, in Hong Kong. And her research area investigates two specific aspects of higher education. English as it's used in educational settings and academic integrity. So bang on for what uh, we're looking at here. And one of the reasons we're obviously interested in uh, the whole area of academic integrity is because of QQI's role in uh, prosecute, prosecuting people who are seeking to, uh, to threaten it. Uh, but one of the other challenges we found is, uh, is the perception that international students or those who don't have English as a first language are among those most open or most vulnerable to this. But what's interesting is Diane is actually going to tell us a little bit about that and how not all of, uh, of that uh, stacks up to what it has to do. So uh, I just want to uh, welcome her and to hand over now to uh, Billy Kelly, who is the uh, chair of the National Academic Integrity Network. Billy. Uh, thank you, Porik. Um, uh, Porik has, uh, has outlined uh, the, uh, today's webinar right away from uh, Diane, Professor Diane Pacarari. Um, we're delighted, right, okay, to welcome you all, right, okay, to this latest webinar, right, okay, uh, organised, right, okay, by the National Academic Integrity uh, Network. Um, some rules of housekeeping. Um, if you could put any questions you have in the chat, and uh, I will moderate those, right, okay, and we will deal with those at the end of the um, uh, of uh, Diane's presentation. So at this point, Diane, I'm going to hand over to you. And uh, thank you very much. OK, very good. Um, so thank you very much for inviting me to, to speak on this topic that's very close to my heart. Um, greetings from sunny Hong Kong. It's, if there's a silver lining from the past couple of crazy years, it's that we've become a little bit easier perhaps about talking with each other over boundaries and time zones and so on. Um, so it's a really great pleasure to have this opportunity. The connection between academic integrity and the second language user has been prominent in the higher education literature for quite some time. Um, consider, for example, this extract from an article from 1982 reporting an academic literacy support program for international students in the US. The author wrote, because of different ethnic norms, some special problems arise in administering a program in which students are drawn from many cultural backgrounds. Cheating and plagiarism are always problems under these circumstances for a variety of reasons, many of them cultural. I should say, by the way, that immediately after this talk, I'll post my slides on my academia and research gate pages. So if this or any of the other references are of interest, that's where you'll be able to find them. So points similar to this have been made by researchers who have immersed themselves in a different cultural context as well. Um, Carolyn Madeline was an American composition teacher who wrote about her experiences teaching in China. And after finding that one of her groups had copied quite a lot from a source that she had assigned them to read, she took them to task for plagiarism. And after that, one of her students produced this reflection. 
After our teacher's explanation, we understand that in her country or some others, plagiarism is forbidden. However, in our country, things are a little different. In these two accounts, we can see evidence of a widespread perception that academic integrity takes on new dimensions when working across languages and cultures. And if this is the case, then the potential for problems is getting bigger, not smaller, because of the relatively recent explosion of English medium instruction, which is causing large numbers of students around the world potentially staying within their own home countries to do their academic work through the medium of a foreign language. So the sheer volume of students making some sort of linguistic or cultural transition in their education makes it imperative to understand how and to what extent these factors play into questions of academic integrity. But while it's very easy to find assertions that there is this interplay, it's much harder to find hard evidence. My objective in this talk is to see what facts we can bring to bear on the question. Before moving on and doing that, though, I'd like to provide some context and set some parameters. First, if second language speaker status creates special issues or special contours for academic integrity issues, then we would reasonably expect that to be the case, whatever the first or the second language is. That is, if Chinese students who travel to the United States encounter these issues, then we would expect that the same would be true in reverse, that American students who travel to China and study in Chinese would have the same issues. But, of course, English has a special status in the world for quite some time, and certainly since the end of the Second World War, English has been growing and developing into a role as the world's lingua franca. And that puts English very much in the spotlight for questions like this. The English-speaking countries punch well above their weight in terms of attracting international students. And in fact, one of the reasons for the growth in English medium instruction is for countries that don't have English as the first or primary language to be able to attract international students. So one way or the other, higher education globally is heavily characterized by the presence of English and growing more so every day. And so my focus in this talk will be on English. I'm also going to focus on the tertiary sector because that's where we see the largest number of students working through a second language. Although I think that many of the, the issues that are relevant here present in similar ways at other educational levels. And I'm going to give a disproportionate amount of attention to one type of academic integrity violation, namely plagiarism, because that's the one that's most frequently mentioned in connection with second language users. Toward the end of the talk, though, I'm going to broaden out and look at the implications for other types of academic integrity issues and also really problematize, um, as I'm trying to do throughout the talk, this question of, is the situation different for second language users? So, to that question, is it true that issues of academic integrity take on a different profile when second language users of English are involved? And what evidence can we find for that idea? Well, there are, broadly speaking, when this idea is put forward in the research literature or when it's talked, of, talked about over a cup of coffee in the staff room, as it frequently is, there are three explanations which are invoked. And they are what I am going to call the 
cultural explanation, the situational explanation, and the discursal explanation. So let's look at each of these in turn and what they say. The cultural explanation is the one that was being put forward by the student in, in the quotation a moment ago who said, in our country, things are a little different. This explanation has a lot of intuitive appeal because we all know that when you travel to another country, most things are a little different. But what is it about academic integrity specifically that might be a little different? Usually when the cultural explanation is put forward, it's framed in terms of perspectives. That is, the framing is not as bold as students from country X cheat more than others. Rather, it's framed as students from country X have perspectives which lead them to believe that certain behaviors are not cheating, although we consider them to be, whoever we are in this context. Here are some versions of the cultural explanation which can be found in the literature. My students' anxiety about appearances, about putting a good foot forward, must enhance their desire to borrow both words and opinions. They find it hard to believe that I really want what I say I want, their own half-formed ideas expressed in their own limited English. So a cultural valorization of keeping up appearances causes students to stretch a little bit too far to do that and to stretch into the zone of plagiarism. The individual versus the, the collective orientation that many people have observed as a cultural difference has also been put forward as an explanation. This author said, in the West, a writer is expected to write something new. By contrast, in Asia, the individual expressive needs have to be sacrificed for the welfare of the society, and the theories and statements of recognized authorities cannot be easily challenged. Another spin on this is respect for authority. A cultural characteristic which is likely to prove awkward here is the idea that good students do not challenge their teachers or other authorities, but faithfully copy and reproduce them. Now, these are three examples chosen essentially at random from the literature. I could find 10 times or 100 times the number of authors asserting that plagiarism is an issue for second language users because of cultural attitudes toward whether you challenge an authority or show it respect by repeating it, whether you go too far in your efforts to put, for, put your best foot forward, that sort of thing. This explanation has been around for a very long time and it seems to be very entrenched, but there's reason, and in fact, I would say growing reason to doubt it. It's been rebutted in a couple of ways. First of all, by people who we could call cultural insiders, academics who come from the cultures that are said to be associated with these values or different perspectives. So in response to this article by Soden, one writer from Vietnam responded this way. Soden seems to suggest that Asian culture contributes to the act of plagiarism. I'd like to point out that plagiarism is never allowed or made legitimate by Vietnamese culture or education. For example, even at primary school level. If a pupil copies another pupil's ideas to reproduce them in his or her very basic compositions, 
Teachers and classmates will criticize and help that pupil realize that it's unacceptable. It's not unusual for school teachers to require students who plagiarize to write down a hundred times the promise, I will never steal others' ideas writing again. These practices show that plagiarism is viewed as unethical. Another response to the same article came from China. I received all of my education with the exception of my graduate study in China, and I never recall any of my teachers telling us it was acceptable to copy others' writing and turn it in as one's own, be it a couple of a paragraph or a couple of sentences. On the contrary, all my teachers often warned us not to copy others' works. In fact, the concept of plagiarism as an immoral practice has existed in China for a very long time. So we have on the one hand observers saying there are these differences and they look to me to be cultural, but then we have people from those cultures responding and saying, no, this is not right. So in addition to this sort of pushback on the idea from people who know the culture as well, we have a small amount of empirical evidence and fortunately it is growing. The results are, however, somewhat mixed. Um, Lee and Flowerdew drew on a whole wealth of archival data to demonstrate that China has a long and still current history of condemning plagiarism. Wheeler did a really creative study in the Japanese context. He took a group of students and gave them three texts which had been written for the purpose. They were given one text to read and asked to comment on its quality. And they were quite positive toward it because it was a well-written text. Then they were given a second text which purported to be a magazine article which had served as the source for the student text. In other words, it became clear that the writer of the first text had plagiarized from the second one. And at that point, they were asked to reevaluate what they thought of the first text. And they lowered their favorable evaluation of it considerably and criticized it for what they now saw to be plagiarism. The third text was one which also made use of some of the ideas in the source but the author had found alternative wordings rather than simply repeating the wordings from the source. So that presumably for a lot of people would have made it a little bit problematic, but not as problematic. And that was precisely the response the students gave. They were critical of the third text for depending too much on the source but not as critical as they were of the first writer who had clearly plagiarized in a very blatant way. So from this, Weir concludes that the findings suggest that one should be careful about concluding that plagiarism is inherent in Japanese culture. And there are a number of other studies that have produced similar findings. Now, a possibly contradictory finding comes from an experimental study that Bikoski and Gu did. Um, they showed, this was also a very creative experimental design. They created a number of videos showing a writing process, showing writers composing, looking at sources, writing, copy and pasting, erasing, and so on. So, Two groups of Chinese students were asked to look at the videos and give their opinions of what the writers were doing. Some of the videos showed good writing practice, some showed questionable writing practice, some showed what was designed to be very clear plagiarism. Now, the two groups of Chinese students were on the one hand in China, and on the other hand, international students studying in the US. Both groups of students tended to criticize the plagiarism, but the students in the US did so a, a little bit more ferociously and used more negatively laden language. So 
they interpret this as evidence in a shift of understandings that happens when students go from China to the US. And then this in turn, they say, suggests that the cultures may in fact have different understandings of what plagiarism is or how wrong it is. So the jury is clearly still out on the extent to which the cultural explanation is valid and true. But the evidence that does exist at least provides reason for us to be cautious about it. And there are practical reasons for that caution as well, because too firm a belief in the cultural explanation can have the unfortunate pedagogical consequence of causing us to misplace our efforts. The cultural explanation is generally put forward by well-intentioned teachers who don't want to believe that their students are dishonest people. And therefore they search for reasons that can help them understand why an honest person engaged in a behavior that is regarded as dishonest. The idea that the students didn't know the behavior was dishonest allows us to resolve that cognitive dissonance, but at a cost. It may lull us into thinking that there's a very easy solution. Some of our students don't know that plagiarism is wrong. We can tell them that plagiarism is wrong and then the problem is fixed. And that might prevent us from doing some of the other things that take a little bit more energy and resources that we should be doing to encourage academic integrity. It may also bounce back on the students. Many a time have I heard teachers say, sure, I understand that some of my students, when they get to my classroom, they may not know that plagiarism is wrong. So the first time I spot a problem in their work, I'll tell them, but if I spot another problem in their work, that will be proof that they're deliberately trying to cheat, which is fair enough, but only if we think that a lack of culturally situated knowledge really was the primary problem, not if other factors also are playing in. So what of those other factors? One is previous experience or what I'm calling the situational explanation. This could at one level be regarded as an extension of the cultural explanation to the extent that we have to regard educational institutions, pedagogical approaches, curricular approaches as being one aspect of a country's culture. An international student in Ireland or in Australia or in some other part of the world has to adapt to doing things in a new way, not how they did them at home. And indeed that is one of the, the reasons why um, international and intercultural experiences are such an important part of education because it, it takes us out of our comfort zone and makes us learn things, learn that things are done differently in other places. So, for example, forms of assessment, such as the essay or the report, extended writing tasks, which students do under unsupervised conditions, are not routinely assigned in every country. In some educational systems and educational institutions, there's much more of a reliance on the closed book exam written in the exam hall, which offers relatively little scope for plagiarism. So students who cross linguistic and cultural borders to pursue an education may find themselves being called upon to write extended texts for assessment purposes without having had much prior experience of doing so. 
and as a result may make erroneous assumptions about what is called for, what is tolerated, what is forbidden. So the situational explanation posits unfamiliarity as a cause of suboptimal behavior, not because the suboptimal behavior is condoned in the student's culture, but because that particular part of the academic landscape is new terrain for the student in question. Like the cultural explanation, the situational explanation relates to a large extent to declarative knowledge about what can and cannot, should and should not be done. A third factor has to do more with procedural and conditional knowledge and specifically the language skills needed to do academic work. Very simply put, academic discourse is very demanding to consume and produce. This is true for everyone, but clearly the demands of working through a second language enhance the difficulty. Importantly, producing academic discourse, whether it's giving a presentation in class or writing an essay, it's a skill. There is, of course, some declarative knowledge involved, for instance, knowledge of the terminology of your field or knowledge of the um, sort of wealth of formulae expressions like as can be seen from table two, which are common in academic discourse. But that's a relatively small proportion of declarative knowledge underpinning the skill that's involved in producing academic discourse. And when we learn any new skill, whether it's playing golf or ice skating or learning to speak a new language or learning to produce academic discourse in a language that we've already started to learn, it is the most natural thing in the world to look to how more proficient people perform that skill and try to imitate them. And this is why a great deal of what gets diagnosed as plagiarism could more appropriately be given a different name. Rebecca Moore Howard is an American composition scholar and she coined the term patch writing to describe the imitative composing strategies of novice academic writers. And she defines it like this, copying from a source text and then deleting some words, altering grammatical structures, plugging in one synonym for another. Sometimes if there's a list, the items in a list will get moved around, one will get taken out, another will be added and so on. Howard postulates that this is a developmental stage. This is something that teachers see a lot. Novice academic writers do this not because they can't be troubled to write independently of their sources, Indeed, patch writing is a lot of trouble, taking disparate chunks of texts and stitching them together and trying to smooth over the, the cracks between them. That's a lot of hard work. They do it because it's the best that they can do at this point in their development as academic writers. Altering borrowed material is on the one hand a way of engaging with the writing process making the resulting text in some sense their own words. It's also a means of engaging with academic discourse, of engaging in the repetition that all language learning involves. So the notion of patch writing provides an explanation for a phenomenon that many educators have encountered. Students who, when reproved for plagiarism, appear genuinely perplexed because to them working with sources, the fact of having worked with them, of having stitched them together and having adapted the language in them may seem like a creative work adding something original to the task and not at all the same thing as copying an entire essay or 
buying an assignment from a cheat site. And that is indeed why Howard found it necessary to create, to coin this term patch writing, to distinguish an unsuccessful approach to using sources from a deliberately deceptive attempt to circumvent the assessment process. In long years of experience of teaching academic writing, I have come to believe that there is a lot more patch writing around than there is genuinely deceptive plagiarism or indeed any other form of academic integrity violation. Now, you may think that I'm just gullible and the balance is wrong. Maybe, maybe you think that I'm, I'm too kind and I don't want to see cheating where it exists. But importantly, they're both out there. The, the inappropriate but quite understandable in terms of source, in terms of where it comes from, active patch writing and deliberate attempts to cheat when students are being assessed, they're both out there. And to promote the high standards that we want to have in our in educational institutions, we have to address all suboptimal behavior, regardless of whether we think it's intentionally misleading or not. So I think this leads fairly naturally onto the question, what do we do? And as we turn to that question, I'm also going to broaden the focus a little bit and start to draw in other issues related to academic integrity beyond plagiarism and also test a bit more directly the notion that second language users may be a special case. So the, the widely adopted approach to academic integrity is to inform stroke warn students about what the rules are and what will happen to them if they break the rules to set up mechanisms that will try to detect to catch students who violate the rules and then to punish the violators who are caught and that is necessary particularly the informing part so some people cheat some people set out deliberately to cheat and making them aware of the rules and making them aware of the fact that the rules are taken seriously and that there are detection and punishment mechanisms that may well have a deterrent effect on some of them and other people may not know what the rules are that is, in fact, the belief that underpins the cultural explanation. And I hope I've given you reason to take that explanation with a little grain of salt. But to the extent that it does have some explanatory power, we can also note that it's not only people who are crossing cultures who sometimes don't know what the rules are. In fact, one of the most enduring truths in education is that people who have been taught something sometimes fail to learn it. Students who have been told do this sometimes fail to. Students who have been told don't do this sometimes do it. So all of our students, regardless of where they're from, need to be told what the ground rules are. And up to a certain extent, this is something that most of the educational institutions and educational systems that I have any familiarity with do relatively well. From information packs, brochures, workshops from the library or the study center, there's a lot of information out there. In two areas, though, I believe that we need to see an improvement. So first, there is in many institutions an overemphasis on warning rather than informing. 
So I would like to shift the emphasis to information, to announcing what, what expectations are, rather than issuing threats about what will happen if expectations aren't met. And there's a very simple reason for that. When people who don't see themselves as cheats, when people have no intention, have no intention of cheating, have to sit through a lecture on cheating, they tune out, they stop listening, and they may miss information that would alert them to a rule that they don't know but need to. And the other issue, the other area where I think we need to see some, some change is that very often the information that students are given is both legalistic and abstract. And that abstraction opens up the very real possibility that students may not understand the full range of activities that come under the heading of an abstract prohibition. But no matter how rich and how accessible, all the information in the world cannot fix a skill deficit. When students are asked to produce academic language that is beyond their capabilities, there can be only three outcomes. In attempting to, to stretch and do more than they can, they may wind up patch writing. Or they may simply say, I can't do this, and therefore I will cheat. I will commission an essay from a, from a contract cheating site. Or they will fail. And most students are mightily motivated not to fail. So if the gap between what students can do and what they have to do to pass is too great, then that creates a pressure which incentivizes undesirable behaviors. It doesn't justify them, but it does create a climate in which they are more likely to happen. So it's imperative to close that gap between what students can do and what they need to be able to do. One means of doing this is by applying sensible admissions criteria so that only students with good preconditions for success are allowed to embark upon an academic journey. Another is to provide adequate academic literacy support. In other words, to scaffold that transition from where they are to where they need to be. I've argued in that sense the second language writer is a special case because the very complex task of producing academic discourse is harder in a second language. But that doesn't mean that it's not challenging for students working through their first language. Bourdieu famously said that academic discourse is nobody's mother tongue. So there's a sense in which every academic writer is working through a second language. And the global expansion of higher education has seen increasing numbers of students from backgrounds without a strong academic tradition coming into the academic world. And that expanding of opportunity is a wonderful thing, but it does make it all the more necessary to balance access against the support needed to succeed. Because as long as we have students who do not adequately master academic literacy in the language of instruction, we will always have academic dishonesty. And this, I think, is an important unifying message. So far, we've had two distinctions up for scrutiny. One is the second language user and whether academic integrity issues are a little different for the second language user than for the first language speaker. And I've argued that the answer is yes in some ways, but possibly in ways which are a little more nuanced than they are often made out to be. I have also proposed that student work 
which is sometimes diagnosed as plagiarism, is in fact patch writing, and that it should be regarded as a different kind of phenomenon. Different from a deliberate attempt to sidetrack the assessment process by engaging knowingly in dishonest behaviors. But if those distinctions add a degree of complexity to understanding students and their choices, there's a degree of simplicity to the solution, an emphasis on the development of academic literacy is necessary and beneficial for all students, regardless of what their first language is. And rich support for the development of academic literacy not only equips students with the ability to do their own academic work, it also sends an important message about what educational institutions value and that in turn contributes to an ethos, to a culture in which the possible temptations to engage in academic dishonesty are counterbalanced by a healthy aspiration to pursue excellence and integrity. Thank you very much for your attention. I appreciate it. And as I said, the um, references the slides with my references, if you're interested in them, will be available on Academia and on ResearchGate. Thank you very much, uh, Diane, uh, for a very informative uh, uh, talk. I'm, uh, I'm struck by, and my camera couldn't go on, uh, I'm struck by the extent to which um, what you've described across the explanations actually is, is independent of international students. That if we look at your cultural situation and, and, and discoursal things, so much of that is relevant, right, okay, to our own students. And I think others have, um, Perry made a point in the chat that actually in here in Ireland, right, okay, and I'm sure this is true of, of, of other English speaking countries, a sizable proportion of our population don't actually speak English at home. Um, Ireland, Ireland would have had very significant, right, okay, inward migration in recent years. And, one in six, one in seven of, of, of the Irish population, right, okay, are, are non-native. Um, and uh, the mother tongue, right, okay, in many cases, the home tongue wouldn't be that. I'm struck by the thing that on academic discourse, right, okay, and the point, right, okay, that you make that this really is nobody's first tongue. Um, is the answer uh, preparatory courses, right, okay, for university students and or is that part of the selection process? Well, I, I think I think it needs to be both, um, and I and I think we we have perhaps ignored the elephant in the room in the sense that as higher education, and I'm, I'm generalizing vastly here, it's obviously different in every in every country and and indeed in every university, but as the higher education sector has expanded globally as rapidly as it has the amount of support, academic literacy support, has not kept pace with the expansion. So I think we've been creating a gap. You can solve the problem from either angle or from both, but if we want to encourage more access to higher education, then we can't, solve, we can't close the gap by being more restrictive in, in admission standards. Although I certainly would like to see some universities um, who sort of encourage international students to come and, and see them as cash cows to raise the IELTS or the TOEFL level that they, they want those students to have when they come. Because I think some institutions are actually setting students up to fail by being too eager to take all comers. But support is, is where it's at because indeed no student gets to university knowing all the things, knowing how to write every genre or produce every spoken genre, understanding how to, to read a complex research article that's assigned and get meaning out of it. So that sort of support is important. It can be pre-sessional, it can be concurrent, 
And importantly, it should, and too rarely is, be part of the content curriculum. So even languages, even universities that have really good support, um, really good English for academic purposes courses, for example, the support tends to begin and end at the door of the English classroom. But it's the, the teachers in the academic subjects that are best equipped to help students understand the discursal standards and practices of their own academic disciplines. So this should really run throughout the curriculum. Thanks, uh, Diane. Uh, you, you touched there on IELTS and, and TOEFL, right, OK, as tests. To what extent, right, OK, do you think they are valid, right, OK, in terms of uh, international students? As, as suitable benchmarks. Right, it's about it's about which benchmark. Um, IELTS and TOEFL are very, very good tests of the constructs that they, they test. So they actually do tell us quite a lot about what students can do and what they can do in an academic setting. They don't tell us everything, but they provide lots of information. Um, there is a tendency, and I, I think it's often a well-meaning one. I, I've heard students who are desperate to get admitted when they, they haven't met the score to say, oh, but I'll work really, really hard. I, I promise I will. And teachers who also tend to think that with hard work, you can you can make up for, for a starting point that's below what it should be. Um, and to, to some extent, you can, of course, but not to any extent. So... IELTS and TOEFL give us lots of good information. Where we go wrong in some cases is by setting the bar too low. Um, to a related question there, uh, do you know of any higher education institutions or jurisdictions which set standards in communicative English competence as a graduate attribute? As a graduate attribute? I do not think I do, no. Yeah, no. no. So, but that's quite telling. Yeah. And um, uh, Dan, um, patch writing, and I can actually see, I can see, and I think probably all of us can see uh, uh, traces of patch writing right in our own histories, right? How best, right, okay, do you work that transition from patch writing, right, okay, into proper academic writing? This is a this is a good question, and it, it's one that we don't really know the answer to, because patch writing is stigmatized as something as wrong as plagiarism. So um, there there was a, a study, oh gosh, published in the 1980s, I believe, um, where it was a case study of of a, of a writer. Um, somebody who'd been out of education and returned to university was struggling to adapt to the writing demands that were placed upon her. And, and this was a strategy that she was using. And the authors speculate, wow, what a powerful thing it would be in teaching the student if we could just forget every concern about rules and say, go on, write. Do, do what you need to do to get your text written, and let's see if that helps you become a more independent, autonomous writer. Um, but, but that's kind of something that as teachers we can't tell our students. We, we, we can't say, okay, for a year, rules about plagiarism, they don't apply, write the way you want to, let's see what happens. That, that's a pretty difficult thing to do, so the answer is that we don't know. And uh, I'm always struck on, about plagiarism by uh, Jude Carroll's point, right, OK, of this continuum on this, right, OK, and at the early parts of it, right, OK, our responsibility to our students is to educate them and to, to find, right, OK, that um, institutionally probably that, that appropriate point where we say, actually, this is a deliberate attempt, right, OK, to deceive. But short of that, right, OK, our challenge, right, OK, is, is uh, education. Um, I'm not seeing other questions, right? Okay, in the in the chat, uh, there is a lot of praise, right? Okay, for 
for the inspiring talk, uh, uh, Diane. You've given us a lot right away to think about, and uh, I think positioned right at least some of our uh, thoughts about international students versus domestic students, right? Okay, uh, more centrally, right? Okay, in terms of that discourse about students in general, right? Okay, and. Um, in some sense, bursting some of those uh, balloons, right? Okay, about uh, cultural differences or whatever, right? Okay, that that are easy, right? Okay, to um, uh, uh, to reach for, right? Okay. Um, one last one I see from Sue. In an ideal world, what changes would you like to see? Um, and what are the particular challenges in monolingual uh, uh, higher education environments? If you could do just one thing, Diane, what would it be? If that that's very easy, but it would be one very big thing. Mm. I I would weave support for the development of academic literacy into the curriculum from day one until the day students graduate in each and every one of their courses in a joined up manner so that there is progression across the curriculum even as students move from one subject to another subject to another subject and i would as part of that make instill in every teacher a sense that teaching a subject means teaching the discourse, the ability to communicate about that subject. You cannot separate those two things out. That's exactly what I could do if I had a magic wand, but it would have to be a really big magic wand because there are not only institutional, um, just rigidities and, and organizational and structural barriers to get over, there's also a massive research uh, resource implication. And this is a time when, because we've expanded higher education in particular, the available resources per student in most of the, the, the societies I'm familiar with are many fewer. And uh, Gillian asks, right, okay, does the way we assess our students have a role to play in academic integrity? I think you touched this on this already in terms of um, the gap between what students can do and what we ask them to do. Are there, are there other more general points on that in terms of assessment? Yeah, so I, th I think first, first I'd like to say something technocratic or, or a technocratic version of what I, what I was saying, which is that um, you know, we, we know that we should have constructive alignment in our courses. We should start with the course intended learning outcomes, build in the teaching and learning activities that lead to them, and then assess the things that we try to teach. And when we use the production of complex written texts as a form of assessment, we either have to teach that, make that an intended learning outcome, um, teach it on the course where we're, we're using it, or we have to be absolutely certain that we can take it as prior knowledge that the students have when they come into the classroom. So that, that very important fact about assessment, that we should only assess the things that we've taught and we should only teach the things that are our intended learning outcomes, I think that often gets forgotten about. But there are other important um, connections to assessment. Um, one is we we get a little bit sloppy sometimes in our assessment. So Maggie Sokolik at Cal Berkeley once said, if an assignment can be plagiarized, it should be plagiarized. If you're setting an essay for your students that they can find a hundred sample answers to on a cheat site, that's a lazy assignment, right? Think it through, <laughs> get creative. Thank you very much indeed, uh, Diane. We've come to the end of our time. Uh, again, thank you so much for Rice Gay for such uh, an informative Rice Gay and 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 uh, challenging uh, talk. Uh, I hope all of us Rice Gay will go go away and reflect a little bit more Rice Gay on what we do and uh, how we how we teach our expectations Rice Gay of students and lastly how we assess them. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you so very much for the invitation. It's been a great pleasure.